we're going to be reading the prophet Isaiah this morning. Isaiah chapter 9, we're going to read verse 2 and verses 6 and 7, very well-known passage in which he foresaw this. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Let's pray. Father God, that's the word that came to Israel 600 years before the birth of Jesus. It's a word that still is alive today and still speaks to us. And I pray that you will bring it to life for us this morning and that you will bring Jesus to life for us, a vision of Jesus and who he is, the things that you want to show us this morning about him. I pray that you will equip me to do that, to speak with words that come from you, give me freedom here, that give us hearts to hear with and above all to hear your Holy Spirit. I pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. This morning, of course, is the first Sunday of Advent. The word, English word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus which means coming. It's a time about coming. It's the four weeks traditionally, the four Sundays traditionally, leading up to Christmas. And it is meant to be then a time of expectancy, of anticipation. And not expectancy and anticipation of the Christmas tree and the presents around it, but expectant waiting for the one that we celebrate at Christmas, the child that was born to us, the son that was given, the Christ child. It is tradition to light candles at Advent. There are four candles around that, one for each of the four weeks, and a center candle which is for the Christ child. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get a little further in. Each week we will be lighting another candle. And we're going to be walking through each week then the verses of a song. We sang the first verse of it this morning, an ancient Irish hymn, Be Thou My Vision. And this week's theme then comes from the first week, the first uh, verse rather. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou be my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence, my light. And we'll draw upon other verses as we go uh, through the weeks of Advent. Now this morning, for this service, I chose the verses that we read in Isaiah. And it starts with verse 2 there, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. If you find yourself in darkness, deep darkness, what do you need the most? Light. Exactly. Exactly. Light. You need that to be able to see. Without it, you cannot see. Without light, we will be lost. And 600 years before Jesus, the prophet Isaiah saw that a people was lost and in darkness. His people, God's people at that time, Israel, they were living, they were walking in darkness. They were not walking God's ways. They were living in the land of the shadow of death, threatened by the superpowers of their days and other enemies. 
And the time would come when they would go into exile because he, was, he foresaw that. Because of their sin, because of turning away from God to go their own way. They are the people walking in darkness. They are the people living in the land of the shadow of death. But Isaiah had eyes to see further than that, beyond the people of Israel. He saw the darkness of sin that had enveloped all humanity since the fall. And how it is that without a Savior, we live in darkness, we walk in darkness, and desperately need light to be able to see. And we often turn to other sources of light, and we think that we have light, and we draw on the light of our own minds. But it's not light. And we fumble around in the darkness, needing it. And we live in the shadow, the land of the shadow of death. Because ever since the fall into sin, death has ruled this world and has had the final word without Jesus. He saw, though, that a light was dawning, a great light that would light up the darkness, that would show the way for people to find their way back to God, to find their way back to his grace and to his mercy, to find their way. A Messiah who would come to set his people free. And that light was a child. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. A child. Born in Bethlehem, a manger, a stable, because there was no room for them at the inn. Greeted there by angels and by shepherds, and later in Bethlehem by wise men. And he would be the Messiah, he would save his people from their sins. And so Jesus is that light. And that is why this morning... We lit the first candle of Advent, and we are on the theme of Jesus, Be Thou My Vision. But we also left the Christ light burning. Traditionally, we leave that until Christmas, and we light it then because that's when we celebrate the Christ child arriving. But it's appropriate to have it burning because Jesus is the light. Jesus is the light by which we see. And we'll be talking about that. He is our vision. He is the one who enables us to see the world for what it is. To see ourselves for who we are. To see our need for him. To find a way back to God and to see the path that leads there. To see and understand that God is at work in this sad world, even in places where we don't know that. To see that we can put our trust in him. And there are some things I believe God wants us to see, things he wants us to know this Christmas season, this Advent season. And not just in our minds, but deeper than that. In our hearts. Or as another age would have said, in the bowels of our being, the very depths of our being. It is something that has to come by revelation to move it from here to the depths. It has to come from God by the Holy Spirit into the deep places of our hearts. And that is what Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 1, a passage that was quoted when, at the lighting of the candles. His prayer, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. On this first Sunday of Advent, 
I believe there's something specific that God wants us to know about himself in Jesus Christ. And that is that he is the God who comes. That's what Christmas is about. The God who comes. So humanity is living in a world full of sin. And how can they be saved? Well, he, God makes a people. He begins a salvation plan. He gives them a temple to worship him in that is a model, an earthly model of the heavens. He gives them sacrifices, animal sacrifices, to pay for the sin because it takes blood to pay. It takes life to pay. That's why death entered into the world. But it's not enough. It's never enough. It can't be enough. It goes on and on, day after day after day, year after year, century after century. Something else is needed. And God could have left humanity there. But what he does is he comes. And he comes in the person of Jesus. Born a baby. Think about that. The maker of the universe and everything in it, who is not himself in the universe, but is outside of it. It cannot contain him. So far beyond us, unknowable, untouchable, comes to earth as a baby who can be held in his mother's arms, in his father's arms. And if you ever held a newborn baby, tiny, helpless, that was God. Coming to be fully human. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, come in flesh to share in our humanity, to live life in a world in which we live it, entering it the way that we enter it, enter it even subjecting himself in the end as a human being to death. He was fully divine. He did not die as God, but he died as a human being because he shared in everything except without sin. Everything we know about life, he knows. Because God doesn't know it just academically, but by personal experience. Because he is the God who comes. Emmanuel, God with us. There's something incredibly powerful in that. Something incredibly powerful that our God comes to us. I don't know of any other religion that would say that their God comes like that. Their gods may come and hide and take sport and what have you, but the God of the universe comes to us and shares life with us. He's not a God who stays far away. He is not a God who is thus unknowable and untouchable. He has shown us who he is by his coming. He's not a God who is indifferent. He's not a God who doesn't care because he lives over there and we live over here. But he has come from there to here to meet us. He is a God who comes to us even in the darkness of this fallen world. And that's the story of Christmas. God coming to us in Jesus. It is what we look forward to. It is what we expectantly wait for. It is his coming. Now it would be quite enough if that was all that there was to the story. If that was the whole story of the God who comes. But it's not. You see, Jesus is not just the God who came, past tense. 
But he is the God who comes, present tense, and who will come, future tense. He will come again at the end of time, when the time is right, to fold up all this world and to usher in a new heaven and a new earth, to renew all things. To accomplish completely the purposes for which he has come. But he's also a God who comes in the present. Not just the past, not just the future. A God who comes in the present. In your life. In my life. In the lives of people we know and love and even those we don't know and love. He is the God who comes. And he comes to us today yet with salvation. He comes to us in places of brokenness and sin where we don't know him. And we have many such stories in this congregation. Stories of places where wandering far from God, walking in the darkness and in the shadow, the land of the shadow of death. And God came. God met them. Later in this Advent season, we're planning to have a profession of faith service on December the 18th, the last Sunday of Advent, the verse about victory won. We're hoping at this point to have 10 people in six adult baptisms. That's what it looks like. And each of them, whether they've been in the church all their lives or not, many of them not, a story of how God came to them, found them, met them where they were, met them as they were, and drew them to himself. And each story that they share, and each story that we have is unique. Because the God who comes, comes to individuals. He comes to you and me in the places where we find ourselves. Into the messes that we've gotten ourselves into. Into the brokennesses that we discover we're in. Each story of the God who comes is unique. Jesus also comes to set the captives free. He comes not just with salvation, that our souls will be saved, we'll go to heaven one day. There is a way open for us to God. But he comes to bring life now, in this world, the place where he himself also lived and where he says, you can live too. And where he puts himself into us, dwells in us by his Holy Spirit. And what does that mean? It means that he comes to us in the places of our lives that are broken. The places of our lives where we don't know what to do, where we feel stuck or we feel trapped. He came to set the captives free. Remember the day that Luke records in chapter 4, where he was standing in a synagogue and he was accorded the honor of reading the scripture that day. And he opened the scroll to the book of Isaiah and he read, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And remember what he did then. He rolled up that scroll and he said to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He said, I am the one that the prophet Isaiah 600 years earlier was talking about. He announced his ministry that day as a ministry of bringing life and of bringing light and bringing deliverance to people in darkness and living under the shadow of death. And he still comes here and now to those kinds of places, those places that we experience, 
Places where we don't truly live. Places where the thief has come and has stolen, killed, or destroyed. Places where we don't dare live, don't know how to live, can't live. Trapped in certain places, stuck, full of fear, perhaps. Many in the congregation like that. And Jesus comes to us in those kinds of places. He comes to us when we mess up, when we've sinned and we think it's unforgivable. How could I do that? We're filled with shame. He comes to those places. He comes. Because he is the God who comes. No matter how awful the sin or how unforgivable, no matter how deep the shame, no matter how broken our life is, no matter how shattered our hopes and dreams, no matter how dirty or unclean, no matter how stuck, he is still the God who comes. We don't always know that. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Because there's something else that God wants us to know here. And that is that the God who comes always comes. He comes when it is time. We don't always recognize his coming because we may have an idea of what that will look like. When he came as a little baby, it wasn't what people expected. But he came. And so he comes to us sometimes and we don't always recognize him. We don't always know him. Because we thought he'd do something different. And it may be that he will resolve whatever it is in our life. It may be that he will simply give us what we need to just walk through it. The courage and the strength. But he comes. And he wants us to know that. That he always comes. Now, as we were thinking about this service and making plans for it and wondering what it was that the Lord would have me speak, Valerie shared with me an Advent blog by Ruth Haley Barton. And her blog opens with words from a book entitled, The God Who Comes. That just really resonated with me by a guy I'd never heard of before, Carlos Carreto. And she begins with a quote from that book. God comes to us like the sun in the morning. When it is time. She says, my favorite time of any day is the pre-dawn moments before the light comes. She gets up early. Sits and watches the world. And if you've been up at that time, you know what it looks like. The darkness starts to thin a bit. There's a hopeful sort of thing going on, she says. The sun is coming closer. As I wait for light. And then she talks about some of the things that happen. Time feels rich and abundant rather than scarce and limited and so forth. But as I wait for light, there's never any doubt that the light will come. Just quiet anticipation. Because the sun always rises. Even if it's behind clouds, the sun, when it's time, rises. And so in the darkness and in the pre-dawn darkness and the beginning of light, she waits. And she draws from that then something for us in Advent of waiting for the God who comes. Waiting for him to come to us. Because he still comes. And he comes in a multitude of ways. I've talked about how he comes with salvation. I've talked about how he comes to us to set the captives free and in the places in our lives of stuckness. But he also comes in all kinds of other ways. He comes in the quietness of our heart 
to speak to us. He comes closer to us and we feel his presence because he has come and made himself known. He comes to us in the quiet affairs of the day and in noisy places too. He comes sometimes to tell us to settle down and wait. He comes to show us a way through. He comes sometimes to nudge us and to point to someone and say, go talk to that person. He comes. He comes in all sorts of ways. And Ruth Haley Barton says he's like the sun who, that rises in its time. He comes. And so we wait for him to come. Now, what about the places where I talked about we don't always know the God who comes? What about that? Well, you may remember a few weeks ago, back in Thanksgiving time, we had a communion service. We had up front here two trees of birch branches. We had leaves, these leaves. And we invited people to sit and think a bit about who they knew God to be? Was there a place where God had come to them? A place where God had met them? Perhaps in a place that was really, really difficult. Because it's often in the darkness that the light dawns. And where you came to know him then in a new way, a different way. To write that on the back of the leaf and then to bring it forward when you came forward for communion to hang it on those trees. You may remember that Valerie was deeply stirred by that, felt we needed to follow up on it and we did the following week then. We invited those who hadn't done it to come forward and do it too and we gathered, we had all those leaves then on those trees. We put those trees later on the sides of this stage. And now for Advent, We've taken them down. We've put up there instead trees for the season. But we have here the leaves that were on those trees. Those two Sundays, those were holy moments. And so I want you to know we haven't taken these leaves and gone through reading them, just wondering how did people respond. No, we simply took them, put them before God here. And this morning, because we took them off the trees, they're in this bowl, every leaf. Every leaf that is here is a place where God has come. There may be leaves, too, that are anticipating God coming somewhere. But they are leaves where God has come and where we know God to be. The God who comes in this place, in this way, in this area. And I am sure that the ways and the places are as varied as we are as a congregation. The way Valerie saw it at the time, I believe correctly is that the leaves were for healing of the nations. I had had that same sense the week before from the book of Revelation, the description of the new heaven and the new earth and the river that flows out from the throne of God and the tree of life on both sides of the river, its leaves for the healing of the nations. And that these leaves then were for the healing of the nations because these are places then where we have faith. Because when we know God as the God who comes in this area, we begin to have faith that God will come here as well. Or here. And we may struggle in those places because we haven't known him coming there yet. But there's something then inside that says he came. He'll come. And you can wait with expectation. And we can do that for ourselves, for the areas of our lives that God still needs to come. Because there are those areas in our lives, those areas in our hearts, aren't there? 
But we can also do that then in faith, stand in faith for those who do not know God who comes. Who believe that it will, things will never, ever change. That it's always going to be the way it's always been. And that's where the gospel comes in and Jesus says, no. Not the way it's always been. Because I am the God who comes. And so in this Advent season, I believe God wants us to see him in that way, to know him in that way, and to know that in a deeper way, that he is the God who comes, who comes to us, the Savior, the one who loves us, the one who knows us. And what I want to do then is to pray for the candles that we lit, the candles that we will be lighting for the Christ candle that we lit this morning. That Jesus will be our vision. That he will open our eyes to see who he is. To have faith for what he does. That he has come, that he will come. That he's still the God who comes. And what I want to do is invite you to stand with me while we pray We're going to pray for these leaves and we're going to pray for God to give us more leaves, so to speak. More places of remembrance where we know him as the God who comes. So Father God, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to us. We thank you that you are the God who comes and that you came A little baby who we celebrate at Christmas, whose coming we anticipate with expectation now in Advent. We have these places where we know you to be the God who comes, places in this congregation, places in our hearts. We don't know that in all of our hearts. There are still deep places that need to be touched to know that you are the God who comes. Nor do all of us know that. There are among us people who do not know you as the God who comes. And we pray this morning that you will come to us in all of the places where we long for you, need you, have given up and live in hopelessness and despair, to raise up faith Faith in us for the places where you're going to come yet, because you have come. Faith for those who cannot have faith, because they just can't stand. May we stand for them. May our leaves stand for them and give us faith then that you are the God who comes. Manifest yourself to us this Advent season in a deeper way as the God who comes to us in particular places of our lives. I pray that and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.